Plenty of parole is called back to order. The time is 1058. Our next case is Mr. Jacob Griffith. Mr. Griffith, if you would please give us your full name and DOC number. Jacob Ray Griffith, 503310. Uh, Mr. Griffith, uh, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record. And then the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will let those persons have indicated they have a desire to speak, to have their input. Speaking here today on your behalf is uh, your mother, Sandy Santos Griffith, and your father, Billy Griffith. Uh, also here uh, in, in opposition is Miss Rachel Gross, who is the victim's mother. Uh, at the end of the hearing, uh, you'll have an opportunity to uh, uh, address the board, say whatever it is you'd like uh, to say, make a brief statement to the board, and then we'll vote. You understand our procedure? Yes, sir. This is uh, Jacob R. Griffith, DOC number 503-310, date of birth, uh, December the 8th of 1986. He's a first-class offender. He has a parole eligibility date of March the 2nd of 2024. He is not eligible for good time. Uh, he has a full term date of August the 14th of 2027. He is currently serving a 23 year sentence for the charge of forcible rape. Is that uh, fairly accurate, Mr. Griffith? Yes, sir. Mr. Griffith, your case has been assigned to me, so I'll begin the interview process, okay? Mr. Griffith, uh, how old are you, sir? Um, 36. And how long have you been in prison on these charges? Uh, since 2004. Okay, so how long is that? Uh, almost 20 years. 20 years? Almost. Not quite 20 years? Yes, sir. Tell me a little bit about your educational background, Mr. Griffith. How far did you go in school? Uh, I went to the 10th grade in high school, and then I dropped out and was homeschooled and got a GED through homeschool. Now, you were, uh, by my calculations, you were approximately 17 years old at the time of this offense. Is that right? Yes, sir. Let's talk a little bit about who you were then. Were you still in school or had you dropped out already? I'd already dropped out. Okay. And were you working? What were you doing? Uh, I was working for, I, I had a couple of jobs. I was working for Chick fil A, which was, uh, my mom got me the job there. And before the incident, I was working at Taco Bell. And uh, who were you living with? My mom and dad. Who else lived in that household? Uh, my cousin, his uh, wife, or baby's mama, and the child. Mr. Uh, Griffith, uh, did you ever have a drug or alcohol problem? No, sir. You ever used drugs at 17? You hadn't tried marijuana or anything like that? Because I seen what it did to my family. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. What do you mean you're seeing what it did to your family? What is that? Uh, just the, the drug use, how it, how it affected my family, alcohol-wise and drug-wise. You know, People in your family were alcoholics? Yes, sir. Like who? Uh, I had cousins, uncles. You know, they drank. Um, mainly my, my younger cousins, the, the old ones that are older than me, but, you know, the, they were the ones that did a lot of the drinking. Tell me what happened in this incident. Tell me what you did and to the best of your knowledge, why? I was, uh, give me one second, I'm, I'm a little nervous. Oh, uh, you can. Uh, the morning of the uh, offense, I was babysitting my uh, my younger nephew, and uh, I was watching a secular movie, and he came in, and some oral things started happening, and then it progressed to other sexual things. How, how many times did you molest this young boy? Just that once. I'm sorry? Just that once. Just the one time? Yes, sir. 
And what prompted you to do that? I don't know if it's stupidity. Well, uh, you've taken sex offender treatment? Yes, sir. You took all three, you took three phases and at some point during uh, the fourth phase you were enrolled. I don't know whether you completed that program or not. Did you actually complete the fourth phase? Yes, sir. I have my certificate. All right. Okay. okay. So tell me, what you learned in the sex offender training that might explain what you did and why you did it? Oh, uh, I believe that, I, that that was because I was in a negative emotional state and I didn't have a, a positive peer group around me to, how can I put it? Uh, I, I didn't have that platform to be able to talk to somebody, you know, to, to reach out for help, you know, and I believe that that led me to commit my offense. Now, you were watching pornographic videos. Yes, how, how long had you been doing that? Not just that day, but how long had you been watching these pornographic videos for a while for now while. throughout your sexual offense treatment and training did you gain any insight as to why you were doing that and what might have led you to do this to this young boy i felt like it was the trigger that's what had triggered me to, to do that. I mean, I don't know why it happened, but that's something that I, I, I never in a million years would have thought would happen, you know, and I see that that was why I committed my offense. It was, it was that porn was my trigger. That was what set me off. And going through this class, I've learned that that's that is that is one of my triggers that I have to stay away from. I have to, because I don't ever want to create another victim like that. I never want to ever. Now, have, did have you learned, or have you come to grips with the fact that this was an eight-year-old child? Yes. What what insight have you learned about that? As far as why you did what you did and how you'll be able to control it in the future. Well, using the sex offender Roco scale, I know that as long as I have supervision or I'm around people who are adults and I don't have access to victims unsupervised that that won't ever happen is it fair to, from from what you're telling me is it is it fair to say that that you believe you need to be supervised uh, and make sure that young children aren't around you anymore otherwise you might do this again is that what i'm hearing to, to a point yes sir but that's for me to do this again will never happen. That is something that I, I, I will not ever do again. And why, why can you say that? Or not, you how, how, can, how can you tell me that? What is it in your training, in your treatment, in the time you've been in prison that, that I should be comfortable with that statement? I mean, that's a statement. You know, I'll never do it again. We hear that a lot from a lot right. of people. Why should I believe that? Because when I when I first came to prison, I, I didn't know nothing. I didn't understand myself. I didn't know who I was. And the years that I've been here, 
and the classes that I've gone through, you know, they've taught me who I am and how to avoid things and how to look at, at, at an opposite side of, of a conflict or whatever the situation may be. And that yeah, I, I, I committed an offense, I committed a crime that, that is just horrendous, but I'm not that person anymore. I'm, I'm not that, that kid who created havoc, you know, that ruined somebody else's life. Somebody who I was, who was supposed to look up to me for security and safeness. I ruined that, but I'm not that person anymore. I'm not a child like I was. I've grown and I've learned from, from my mistakes. I've learned from other people listening to other people who are older and wiser than me. Mr. Uh, Mr. Griffith, let, let, let me ask you this. Now, you, you were interviewed by the SOAP panel, the sex offender assessment panel, right? You remember that? There's an interview with you. Um, oh, Mr. Burgos, yes, sir. And when was that interview? Do you remember? Not long ago, was it? No, I don't remember. Okay. I don't well, remember. in in that interview yeah, with funny. in that interview with the panel, you denied having done this. You remember that? Remember telling them not long ago that you didn't do this, and then you changed your mind and said, "Oh yeah, yeah, I did do it." You remember that? No, sir. That uh, interview was May the 1st, Mr. Maribel. Of this year, right? May the 1st of this year, yeah. Yeah, uh, on, uh, I've got, uh, you know, I'm looking at the assessment, uh, Mr. Griffith. Uh, uh, he said that you were hesitant in ask, answering questions, and then you denied, uh, uh, ever having done this, and then all of a sudden uh, you said that uh, yes, uh, you did. So uh, you, you don't remember that comment? No, sir. You're the. the uh, I'm going to read you the statement. He states that the charges against him were totally fabricated. And he was forced into a false confession by a detective while under duress. You don't remember saying that? No, sir. Why would someone write that in a report? Tell me what other programs that you, you've taken while you've been uh, in, in prison that would help you. Uh, I've taken anger management. I've taken uh, the re-entry class. I've taken two Votex, Celebrate Recovery, Cleansing Stream, uh, Faith-Based, uh, Faith-Based Tier Program, and Kairos. Now, now, Celebrate Recovery is primarily a substance abuse type program, isn't it? Yes, sir. And I understand that uh, you were uh, a mentor and a facilitator of that program. Is that right? What did you learn? I mean, you told me you don't have a substance abuse issue. You never did drugs or drank it. Tell me what you learned and what, as a facilitator and as a mentor in Celebrate Recovery, how does that sort of addiction program uh, affect or, or relate to you in the crime that you committed? Uh, the, it teaches you about a minute about looking to God to or your higher power, whatever that may be. And um, 
basically having a support group is 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 that's that's what I was I always taught in the class was having that support group, somebody that you could confide in. You know, being able to admit to yourself and others, you know, that what you if you've done something, you know, or whatever the case may be, having that that confidant to be able to talk to. You know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Griffith, um, a lot of times in, in substance abuse programs and addiction programs and things like that, uh, one, of, one of the things that, uh, you know, an addict learns is that they're always an addict. They will always be an addict. Unless they fight day after day after day, they're going to go back to using drugs and they're going to go back to using alcohol. Uh, you, know, you indicated to me earlier about what you learned in substance abuse, I mean, in uh, sex offender treatment, that you need to be supervised and, and you need to be on the alert for all of those things. So those are all things that you learned, or at least they taught you. And then when I ask you, well, do you think it's necessary that you be supervised or you might relapse? And your answer was no, I'm never going to do that again. So I wonder, uh, I mean, have you discovered or do you believe that you have some sort of sexual addiction and you were doing, you were watching pornographic movies, uh, you molested uh, and raped a eight-year-old boy? Do you think that you have some sort of a sexual addiction? Yes, sir. So how can you tell me you're never going to do that? Because I'm going to fight every day not to. I'm sorry? Because I'm going to fight every day not to. So. Is it fair then, I'll repeat the question I asked you before, is it fair to think that if you are not strictly supervised and you are in the presence of young children without significant supervision, this could happen again? Yes, the possibility is there, but the answer is no. Because I'm not that person. Well, I, I I don't I don't know that that an addiction goes away. You may not be the same person that you were at 17 years old, but if you have an addiction and you have a sexual addiction, whether it's alcohol, substance abuse, whatever that addiction is, you're always being you will always be that addict. Tell me what you've learned about uh, what your crime did to the victims. What do you say? You said, what Tell me your thoughts about what effect your crime has had on that then eight year old boy. It's devastating. It, it, it's, it's ruined me. It's, it probably gave him a sense that people who were supposed to care for him and love him and protect him, that he can't trust in people anymore. That, I mean, it's something that I, 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 I could never explain. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I know, I know that it, it it's ruined me. It's it's unforgivable. I keep saying eight year old, but I think your your uh, cousin was five years. Yeah. Tell me what your transition plan is going to be. It's my understanding that you want to go to Texas. Yes, sir. Tell me about uh, what your plan would be in your transition. Um, 
I have 10 acres in Atlanta, Texas, and uh, I plan on going out there. Uh, my mom and dad are going to come live with me, you know, once we, you know, upon uh, granting of parole, they're going to move out there. Uh, I have a little shop, little house, a 280 square foot house with a shop, and uh, I'm going to do employment wise, I'm, I'm going to start my own leather business. Uh, I've been leather crafting in prison for a couple of years now. And, uh, but in order for me to do that, I'm going to have to get another job somewhere, which, you know, the area around there is full of ranches, you know, farms, ranches, and they're always looking for day workers, always looking for hands, you know, and I'm going to try to sign in with one, you know, one or two of those and to make my money so I can start my own business. Uh Tell me a little bit about your disciplinary record. I know my last write-up was an unauthorized area. You've had 46 write-ups, as I understand. Is that fair to say? Uh, I believe that would be correct. And you had four in the last uh, two, three years. Why, yes, why, why so many in the last couple of years? Uh, just aggravation. I'm not gonna lie to you. We were on COVID protocol and just when we'd get out, just being trying to talk to my friends and being in the wrong place where I'm not supposed to be. Mostly disobedience. You had uh, four uh, disobedience charges, uh, two unauthorized areas, uh, general prohibited behavior. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of, you know, I, I, I don't know, it, it seems to suggest to me that you've still got some issues that need to be resolved, right? that you, you, you're in a very strict environment, but you don't follow all of the rules. Uh, that bothers me when I am convinced if I vote to let you out, you're going to have to follow a very strict regiment to make sure that 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 nothing like this will happen again. And I'm not sure that you have the the I don't know if the term is willpower or the ability to be able to do that. Tell me why I'm wrong about that. I, I have the willpower and I have the ability and I and I'm that, that's that's not an issue at all, Chairman. And well you gotta tell why that's not an issue. Don't you say it's not an issue. You want to, you want to hear why it's not an issue, uh, uh Justice. You can't just say that you explain it that you know tell him why it's not an issue. Because I'm going to be somewhere where I'm not going to have to have any problems. That's why. It's not an issue. Security, I mean, you know, have, having authority, authority over me, I've always respected my authority, you know, and. So you say one of your risk factors is you can't be around all the Young children, so you're gonna make sure you're not around young children. That's what you're saying, right? Yes, sir. You can recognize your risk factors, and you're not gonna put yourself in that situation. Yes, sir. That's 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 what Mr. Maribel is trying to get you to talk about a little bit about your uh, sex offender therapy and the risk factors and, and, and the things that you you know can't do to put yourself in certain situations. That's what he's asking. You. Gordon, what can you tell us about uh, Mr. Griffin? Well, uh, Mr. Mayor Valley's record speaks for itself. He's had uh, some, some programming. He's had, you know, he has had a few write-ups. The last one you mentioned was unauthorized. The area uh, that he went to, 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 a, to a dormitory he wasn't supposed to uh, go to to try to talk to somebody, one of his friends or something like that. He's, uh, you know, overall he's done Fairly well at this institution. He came here from Winfield. He had a bunch of write-ups he got while he was at Winfield, but he did get his, uh, he does have his uh, high school diploma, that was confirmed, and his risk need assessment score is low. 
and I think his static 99 was low to moderate. Uh, so that's about all I can tell you, Mr. Maribel. I, I noticed Warden on his institutional report, uh, he was uh, given a fair rating as opposed to a good rating. Uh, we see that sometimes. Uh, do you know if there's any significance to that? Uh, can, can maybe you shed some light on that? Well, I would think that uh, that was because of the number, overall number of write-ups he's had and the recent, uh, recent write-up history. And plus he has had a, uh, he was enrolled in the uh, in victim awareness back early this year in March of, March of this year, and he got put out of the program because of poor, poor participation in the victim awareness program. Uh, that was noted by Ms. Robinson, so that probably those things probably all played a factor in that, Mr. Maribel. Thank you, Warden. Thank you for your comments. Uh, any questions? I, I do. I have. Uh, you were, uh, let's go back to, to uh, who you were at 17. Do you remember, how did you get exposed to pornography? Do you remember how that came about in your life? Through my friends. Uh, were your friends your age or were they older? Uh, I had some older friends. I, I tend to hang out with older people. Okay, so it was the adults that introduced you to pornography. Yes, ma'am. Adult friends. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Were you ever a victim of any kind of inappropriate sexual acts upon you when you were a child? No, no ma'am. Never were. Okay. That's good to hear. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Griffiths. Um, yes, ma'am. Do you believe you have an addiction to pornography? An addiction to pornography? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. You know, although we can put all kinds of conditions on you about, you know, ha having access to computers, having access to any of your login information, having access to your phones, but you can access pornography you know, it's pretty easy to access pornography. And if you're addicted to pornography and if your viewing of pornography is what uh, triggered you to um, perform these acts on your cousin, how, how can we be sure that you're you dealt with your um, addiction to pornography because I haven't really heard you talk about that. And so, what do you want to say? Well, and and this is probably going to sound really funny, but I've been down almost twenty years now. I've I've never had a Facebook page. I don't even know what that is. If I don't have a computer, if I don't have a cell phone, and I don't have any type of way to access this pornography, which I mean, granted, yes, ma'am, I can go to the store, I can go, you know, watch it on TV, you know, on channels. But if if I if I fight myself to stay away from what I know is triggering or is a trigger, then I believe, you know that I'll be able to, to control myself because I know what my trigger is. And I know how the, 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 the devastation and the harm that it's caused. So if, if I can battle myself daily to, to stay away from that. Okay, I want you, I want you, I want to listen, you listen to the words. If I battle myself every day, if I control myself every day. If you're if you're constantly having to battle thoughts, desires, 
that's not something you can sustain. It's, it's not a matter of willpower. If you have to battle it every day, then you're gonna you're gonna stumble. That's just the reality. And so I'm I'm concerned about you. I really am concerned about you. I really am concerned that you don't know the extent of your problem and that you haven't really dealt with you know, the root cause of your problem. Because if you gotta battle something every day, you're gonna you, you, you're gonna grow weary and you're gonna give in. And that's just the reality. That's with anything. Food, alcohol, drugs, various days a constant battle, then you're already destined to lose. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Now we'll hear from supporters. We'll hear from your mother, uh, Ms. Sandy Santos Griffith. Uh, Ms. Griffith, I don't believe that you, you, you need to unmute your microphone for us to hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am, we can. Okay. Um, my name is Santos Sandy Griffith, and I'm Jacob's mother. He's a, he's an adopted child that my my husband and I have never had children, so he's adopted, and we couldn't have asked for a better child. What is it? I did. Can you hear me still? Yes, we can hear, we can hear you. We can hear you well. Okay, because my, my nephew had came in here to see if I was still talking. Um, my husband and I are 74 years old, and he has Parkinson's. And I need my son home. We both do, because I need the help. My husband's 210 pounds, 5'10", and I'm 112 pounds, 4'10". So it's a struggle for me to have to help him each day, to tend to him, to feed him, to dress him. And I just need him home. And I know that he has what he has done. And I know he he's remorseful for what he for his actions. My husband can't hardly talk. But he's gonna try to talk talk to y'all. It's a struggle for him every day. He has to ask me to help him dress, feed him, change him. He's he's housebound, you know. Every time that we go see Jacob visit him, it's a struggle for him to get in the car. Or get in the wheelchair and his feet swell up real hard that's a that's a long trip an hour's trip to go see him but we try to do the best we can to try to support our child and we just need him at home because we don't know how many more days we have left on this world I have help from the VA that comes in four times, four days out of the week, four hours, and they help me. But then I have the rest of the day and night by myself. They have to tend to him. And it's hard. I don't want to hurt myself trying to lift him up because I don't know what's going to happen then if I get down what's going to happen to him it, Ms. Griffith we, we, we understand your needs and we appreciate your comments thank you very much we, thank you your husband wish to say something I'm Griffith. Griffith. Billy Griffith 
I mean, Dad, like you said, we adopted him when he, when he was a week old. We couldn't have any children. And we've always had him in church. I know he's going to be continuing going to church when he gets out. And I, I'm a veteran. And I got Parkinson's disease. And I require a lot of help. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. I, I do understand. I appreciate the comments of both you and your wife. Thank you. Now we hear from um, Ms. Rachel Gross. Ms. Gross. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you very well. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, my name is Rachel. Uh, I'm Kane's mom. Um, I wrote some stuff down. Uh, I, I know about addiction. And to you, Jacob, I fight it every day. And for you not to know what addiction even means or that you have more than one trigger or understand anything about addiction all you wanted to learn in the programs that you took there were stuff so you could hurry up and try to get good time off your time center i have known you that, that, Ms. i've started Ms. Gross, Ms. Gross, i think you're addressing uh -huh. mr griffith oh. please address the board and not mr oh, griffith i'm sorry i'm sorry but the uh i'll just read what i have written down <laughs> Uh, the day that I, that day that Kane had told me what had happened, uh, I thought was the worst day of my life. My baby's crying. He's bleeding. I'm trying to make sure that he's okay. Get him to the hospital because that's what I was afraid of. I was afraid that he really hurt him. I didn't care about the cops. I didn't care about telling his parents. I wanted to make sure my kid could have kids. He didn't have AIDS. Um, you know, the, the health stuff. I couldn't even console him. He had to be turned over. When we went to the emergency room, he had to be turned over to the doctors, nurses, caseworkers. Um, we did social workers, detectives, counselors, and psychiatrists. All he wanted me to do was hold him, and I couldn't. To him, he was just getting punished again, all over again. My baby boy's never been the same. Uh, what I want this board to know is to not just to look at the crime that he's been committed of, to take a that all those been 19 years, I know, to the how many years to the day? 19 years. What happened that day to Kane is still happening because of monsters like Jacob. They kill our children. It may not be physically, but they kill their soul. They kill our children's innocence. Cain became very detached. He was just this back when before all this happened. He was just a little boy who never was never given the chance to be a kid. He was smart and fun, loving child. We'd like to show everyone how much he loved them. Now he doesn't 
he didn't even make friends at school because he thought he was different than everybody. Um, he said nobody had been through what he had been through. So here's Cain. He was a very outgoing and sweet, kind, loving, playful kid. Becomes a five-year-old with uncontrollable feelings of shame and guilt, fear. He didn't make friends when that time of his life and he when he was five. It was so important that companionship in school. Um, his social connection was just not even there. Ms. Ross, uh, uh, we're going to need you to wrap up a little bit. We okay. understand what you're saying. We've okay. read all of the information that was submitted to us. So if gotcha. you wrap it up. Uh, quick. Sure. Uh, Kane still doesn't talk about that. And he fights it every day. He battled drug addiction. Um, one day he, you know, he hints around that he wants to talk about it, but I, he, Jacob just wants to tell you exactly what you think you, he thinks you want to hear. And I don't want him to get out anytime sooner than, I think it should start this whole sentence. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burris. We appreciate your comments. And Mr. Uh, Griffith, is there anything you'd like to say to the panel before the panel votes? I just want to say that I'm not that same person anymore. I've changed. I've learned. I've grown. I, I, I acknowledge what I did was wrong. That it was it was horrible. And no amount of asking for forgiveness will ever change it. But I respect whatever decision y'all make, be it a granted or be it a rejection. I accept it. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Griffith. And Ruth. Yes. Mr. Griffith, I want to tell you, this is a very difficult case for me. Uh, one, it's because of the nature of the offense it makes it difficult. But also the fact that you were only 17 years old when you committed this crime. Uh, and, and sometimes it's easy to say, you know, poor person was 17 doesn't define who they are today. But I think for someone like you who seems to have this addiction to pornography, uh, who recognizes that you have potential to reoffend if you aren't kept under strict um, parameters, you know, it's almost like you have to be in prison outside the walls of prison in order for you to not reoffend. And I just don't think that's healthy for you. And I don't think that's a doable thing. Also, while I sympathize with your parents, I think it would be absolutely too much pressure on someone who has been in prison for 23 years trying to navigate, coming back into the world, trying to comply with just all the restrictions that you will face as a uh, child sexual offender. And to have put on your shoulders also the burden, I won't, I won't I'll change that word, the responsibility of being a caregiver for your dad, I think it's unrealistic to think that you're going to be able to succeed given all of those, those pressures that you're going to have. And being a caregiver is a very difficult thing and it's very stressful. And sometimes when we're under stress, we go back to the thing that gives us comfort. 
and pornography for you seems to be the thing that gives you comfort. And so for me, I just don't think you're ready today. I think you have some more work to do. I think you still pose a risk uh, to the community. And so my vote today uh, is to deny, but keep working on yourself. Come to, I mean, come to grips with, you know, why pornography appeals to you. Because until you get a handle on that, you're never going to have healthy relationships with, with women, with other people. I just think you have some more work to do. So I encourage you to keep working. Uh, don't you know, take this as a, a reason to act out and get more disciplinary write-ups. You know, demonstrate that you can handle frustration. Demonstrate that you can um, you know, get disappointed and yet not fall back into your own. So my book today uh, is not yet. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Griffith, uh, you know, during the course of my interview with you, uh, I had some, some significant questions, and those questions still persist. Uh, you know, uh, you, you, you have had a number of write ups in the last few years, uh, which suggests to me that. that you can't control what you think you can control. Uh, you know, you, you were removed from victim awareness, which I think is a significant program because you didn't participate. You don't know why you didn't participate or why you were unwilling to participate, but you didn't. Uh, you know, you're, you're Sex offender assessment panel indicates that as of recently as May, you denied even doing this. Now, you denied that today. You denied you didn't tell them that, uh, but you did. Uh, you know that's what they wrote down. I don't know why they would write that down if, if that's not true. Uh, you know I am very, very, very concerned about your ability to control your addiction. I think that you need more work. You've done a lot while you've been in there. There's no question of that, but you need more work. I think things like thinking for a change, participate in victim awareness program, understand what makes you tick, understand uh, uh, what your triggers are. I mean, you know, you and I had that conversation. I mean, one minute you were suggesting well, this is what I'm going to need to do, but I'm not worried because I'm not going to do it again. And, uh, you know, and, and, and Judge Jackson asked you a few questions, and you did. You used the words battle every day, or fight every day. Well, it's true. You will have to do that. But you can't, you, you can't do that without the proper tools and the proper attitude to be able to do that. So I'm going to encourage you to work on yourself to look introspectively and try to figure out what it is that caused all of this and what it is that you might be able to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, so my vote likewise would be to deny. Ms. Weiss? Oh, young Megan, and, and you are a young man, so you got time, you got time ahead of you, you know that. But also going back to that report, when, when you said that you denied it, the report said, you then changed your version of the events and explained that you were guilty of all the crimes in which you were convicted of and that, that the facts presented by the police detailing your crime was accurate. But it took a little bit before you admitted, this is going back to that interview a few months ago when you uh, said to be interviewed. And it's important for me is that you own it every room you're in. That's who I was at 17. That's not who I am now at whatever age I am. 
You got to own it every place you go. That was who I was, but it's not who I am now. Keep your head up high and walk in who you are now. Don't let nobody remind you of who you were. I mean, they can remind you. You just know that that's not who I am today. But own it everywhere. When you're not, when you're not taking full responsibility everywhere, that's that's concerning. That's concerning for me. And, uh, so my vote, I concur with my colleagues. My vote today is to deny the impact of the of the crime on the victim. The victim had no comments. PNP reached out to the victim. He had no comments. The mother is strongly opposed. We have law enforcement opposition. Uh, the age of the victim, the impact of the of the crime on the victim, all that's concerning. So when you come before the board next time, there will be a next time. Own it. Own every bit of it. So you won't be that person again. Best wishes to you, young man. Mr. Griffith, you have three votes to deny, but encouraging you to work on yourself. So good luck to you. Sir. No. She was on, yeah, you, you just seen her. She Cockroach. And then the family, the enablers. Right there, you heard them at the end? It was because of the mother. It was because of the mother they didn't let him out. She was going to go on to say, yeah, did you see her? Can you imagine blaming the victim's mother for keeping your cockroach? You know, you think you've seen it all with these cockroach hearings? But then you... you you just get hit in the side of the head with something more disturbing, more crazy. And this hearing just took the strangest turn. He, he, it's his nephew. He's the uncle. He's supposed to be. And he says that the, his five-year-old nephew walks in the room. He's watching porn. And then he does that to him. He says, it, 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 it starts with oral and then other things happen. Why did he do it? Stupidity. That's his answer. And then the entire hearing is focused around his addiction to porn and how porn is the cause of what he did to his five-year-old. It's just nuts. Why was that the focus of this hearing? He was probably relieved to be like, wow, they're talking about this addiction to porn. What 19-year-old doesn't watch porn? Who said he was addicted? What does it have to do with it? Now, I, I, I actually am. I do believe that porn addiction is a major problem, mostly unspoken problem that that is is a really big issue today. But that's not the point in this conversation. He likes children. He doesn't, he, 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 that's what, he's a monster. He's a cockroach. He's, he's a chomo. He doesn't deserve to ever be free, ever. Can never walk another step in this world amongst us. And it's insane that he will. He will be out. I don't think he's getting another parole hearing. They passed a new law, thank goodness, where these offenders have to wait five years instead of a year or two for their parole hearing, and he's going to be out in five more years. And, and 
you know what's interesting about this hearing is that you were actually able to hear it for yourself. There's nothing that's going to stop him. The, what he described as the thing to stop him was prison. Somewhere where children won't be around. Somewhere where there'll always be someone watching him. That sounds a lot like prison to me. Where you belong. This hearing also, it showed perfectly how manipulative, how slimy, how disgusting these cockroaches are. He went to his pre-parole hearing investigation, May 1st. The date of this hearing is July 10th, two months and 10 days. He went and he told them that he didn't do it. He went and he told them that he was coerced by the detectives to make that statement. And only after pressure, and who knows what they said, maybe even telling him that he'll have no chance of parole unless he admits his guilt, only then did he admit his guilt. And then when the parole board brings it up, he sits and lies to them. He lies straight up lies and they really just moved on which fine but you could have held him up you could have brought it to his, you could have said you lied to us I don't trust a word you're saying he's a weird kind of chomo most chomos we had just earlier today a chomo that had write-ups and he had write-ups too. What's weird about it is they don't get write-ups. They, they, there's something bizarre about them where they don't get write-ups. They get locked up and they follow the rules because they're manipulative cockroaches. But he couldn't even control himself. He got he he got kicked out of victims' awareness. Is doesn't that say it all? When he had to explain what he did, he, he said, I was in a negative emotional state. I didn't have a platform to reach out for help. What the F are you talking about? So you anally penetrate your five-year-old nephew? It was just 70, less than three months ago, and you were denying that this even happened. And then your adoptive parents have the balls to blame it on the victim's mother. And talking about the victim's mother, I was so happy for her, proud for her. You know... It seemed like it came, went off to a rough start. And you can tell by that she's, like she said herself, she knows addiction. But when she zeroed in, she said things that I, that, that we have been saying all along. He said, she said, it's like, it's like he 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 killed her son. Not actually killed, but he killed his soul. They kill our children's innocence. You know, where are the prosecutor? Where is the DA? Where are the when, when they hear, when they, is, that is so, it's so clear. It's so true. And where is the DA here? They didn't show up. They're not here to protect the innocents. They're not here to be their 
side by side with the victim's mother, who you could tell is just has has been struggling. No. No, no, no. They're, they're probably busy locking away someone who stole a purse. Broke into a car. Maybe in possession with intent to, to, to steal, to, to sell. They'll, they'll be there for that. But you take a five-year-old's innocence, you take their soul, and we just don't care in the system. He got a 25-year sentence. And he'll be free. And what do you think? Like Miss Y said, yeah, you are a young man. You know how many more years ahead of him he has of doing this to children? And if you ever needed to hear about it, to see it, it for yourself, he is being set up when he gets out. He's going to... He's going to have his, his adoptive parents su supporting him financially. You know it. He's going to be in some remote town somewhere, maybe a different state where he can try to hide, be given trust in this unbeknownst little town with a bunch of ranchers and church-going people. And what do you think he's going to do? What, where do you think his uncontrollable urges are going to go? With his enabling adoptive parents. His mother said, when the first thing, this is what she said. We couldn't have asked for a better child. You can't blame a parent if this happens. But don't be in denial about it. Don't be an enabler. What we just saw was an enabler. And she's the whole time pleading how she needs his son to come back so he can help get her husband dressed. Help him go to the bathroom. What planet do you live on that that's ever going to happen? Five-year-old baby. He had it, it, all his innocence, his, his five-year-old baby. And this sick, abomination ripped it away for his own personal pleasure at five years old he couldn't he, he make friends anymore he couldn't he, it changed him forever and now he's he's and then he has to deal with addiction and he has to deal with, and you see even when they asked him for comment he said no comment because he's never like his mother said, he's never even, he's just. I timed the. Uh, I use a stopwatch to time their final statements. It was four minutes and 12 seconds the mother was talking before Mr. Mirabella asked her to wrap it up. So it was a minute, 12 seconds over, and then she ended up going for five minutes, 51 seconds. Why he had to ask her to wrap it up, there's one speaker. It's a minute and 12 seconds over. I just don't get it. Let her speak. He didn't go to trial. She didn't have a victim impact statement. Maybe she did at the at the sentencing. I don't know. But it's been 20 years. Let her speak. Let her speak. It was three minutes for the mother. 
I know it felt like 30, but it was it was only three minutes. For the uh, the victim's mother who said she couldn't she couldn't ask for a better son. Apparently she's got the best son. She couldn't ask for a better son. She's got high standards. What a curse. You go and adopt someone as a little baby and, and <laughs> I think his whole his whole final speech was like it seemed like fake crying to me. It just seems so fake. So pathetic. He says, that's who I was, but that's not who I am. Oh, no, Miss Wise said to him, remember to say, that's who I was, but that's not who I am now. And that's the mistake that, that this board has with these offen offenders. It's not who you were. It's who you are. You know, it's funny they say it with the addiction thing. Once an addict, always an addict. Well, they should say once a cockroach, always a cockroach. Once a chomo, always a chomo. They are always going to be obsessing about children. It's it's what they are. They can't help it. So you can't, they're talking about, well, you're going to go dating and, and for women and you're going to have to, and, and they're saying, and the porn is going to get in the way of that. It's like, what are you talking about? He doesn't, that's not even what he's into. You think he should ever date the, to the idea to think that he can he's gonna have he might have children one day? What do you do when someone who, who does that to a five-year-old has kids? Can you keep them away from their kids? It's it's just it's just maddening. It's it's like the board had to just pigeonhole this hearing into into this porn addiction thing and it's like what are you even talking about not everything needs to be addiction he's a cockroach he's obsessed with children he's forever going to be a child predator you can't put him into some program and it's going to fix him now they denied him Right, and he's gonna get out, and he's gonna. It's scary. It is so scary because they are walking amongst us. They are living amongst us, and we need to do our work to make sure that we know who our neighbors are. Because it could just be that 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 young man who's helping his old elderly parents with Parkinson's and selling leather wallets and boots at the local store is your worst nightmare. Literally. But with that, I'll let you go.